Hello everyone, Princess here. Due to health reasons, I was unable to really get a video out, health and a lot of travel, but I didn't want to leave this month without doing a single video. So I am going to share with you all this awesome video I did about the movie Passing for Nebula. I think it's a really good video and I am happy to see it be shared with more folks and I hope y'all enjoy get something out of it and I just want to thank the members of my patreon and my sponsor word anvil for helping all of this come together when it was announced that Rebecca Hall was making a film adaptation of Nella Larson's passing and the images came out there was discussion if the leads Tessa Thompson and Ruth Nega passed and a larger conversation about what it meant to pass at the time the book was written versus today. So in this video, we're going to discuss passing, the novel, the film, the concept of passing today and at the time that Nella Larson was writing this novel. Today's sponsor is Word Anvil. Something you might not know about me is that I love tabletop RPGs. I collect a lot of the books and I have been taking lessons in how to become a game master because I want to run a Power Rangers Mighty Morphin campaign. But one of the things that I find to be daunting is trying to figure out everything, keep track of character stuff without just drowning in the many notebooks that I already own, which is why today's sponsor World Anvil is so perfect, not just for me, but I'm sure for a lot of people out there who love building and creating worlds. Word Anvil is a fantastic world building platform which allows you to organize both information for novels but also RPGs. The system is built to fit over 45 plus games, including Fate, Tales from the Loop, Legend of the Five Rings, Numenaria, Call of Cthulhu, and of course Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons, the ones that everyone plays. Plus, if you're also a fantasy novelist like myself, you can set up your magic systems rules, import maps, and other features to keep track of everything within your world building. There is a whiteboard feature that gives you sort of a blank canvas where you can add articles, images, and do these expansive mind maps with connections between points, a mood board, flow charts for storytelling and ideas that you are building together. World Anvil's latest feature is called Chronicles, which allows people to connect timelines and maps. This is really awesome because if you are like a big map nerd and you wanna make sure that you are world building more than anyone will ever truly appreciate they ask you how you are and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. Chronicles allows you to give a visual representation of important events in correlation to where they happen in the world. It supports you having multiple maps and multiple timelines with a built-in setup wizard, meaning it is gonna be very easy for people to jump in and use the tool. So regardless of if you're looking to work within a tabletop RPG or build your own fantasy land, World Anvil gives you the tools. If you use my code Princess Weeks, you will get 40% off any yearly subscription. Again, that is code Princess Weeks at worldanvil.com for 40% off. And I gotta say, I started using this service. It is really user-friendly. I've used Scrivener, I kind of find it overwhelming. So this was absolutely a happy alternative and I definitely recommend it. And now I can finally uh, take all these RPG ideas and put them somewhere, even if nobody ever plays with it. And let's get into it. To understand passing, it is important to acknowledge its author, Nella Larson, and how she compared to her black contemporaries during the Harlem Renaissance. So Larson had a white Danish immigrant mother and a mixed race Afro-Caribbean father from the Danish West Indies. Her father, whose name um, that we know to be Peter Walker, was not in her life, and she was primarily raised by her white mother in Chicago. However, at this time in Chicago, it was before the Great Migration, which is the period in which a lot of Black people left from the South up North into the Midwest. Um, so when Nella Larson was growing up at this period in Chicago, it was a city that was like one percent black in that way she grew up very separated from her blackness with no exposure to her black father who left the family and living in a primarily white immigrant household 
As Black novelist Daryl Pickney wrote of her background, as a member of a white immigrant family, she, Larson, had no entree into the world of the blues or of the Black church. If she could never be white like her mother and sister, neither could she ever be Black in quite the same way that Langston Hughes and his characters were Black. Hers was a netherworld, unrecognizable historically and too painful to dredge up. As a result, her blackness existed very much within the otherness of her own heritage. I myself am first generation black American. Both my parents are black from the Caribbean, but I have four black grandparents and regardless of my immigrant status, I share very much in the cultural experiences of being a black person raised within blackness in a primarily black community growing up because I'm from Brooklyn and I grew up in, um. East New York. Larson didn't have that despite being, while very light skinned and Eurocentric in some of her features, visibly black and very much identified as a woman within the black experience. And I think it's important to understand that this experience is different from today where with a handful of exceptions, we see a lot of famous black biracial folks being raised by a white mother. And there is a lot more you know, exposure of that. And it's it's definitely more normalized. Sorry, whenever I hear my cat do something, I'm like, is she okay? And because of all of that, it makes sense that she would write a book like Passing, a story that very much deals with the connection in blackness that goes beyond phenotype and is a much more intimate spiritual connection that when you're away from, you, you, you reach out to. So Passing was first published in 1929 and takes place primarily in Harlem, centering around the reunion between two friends, Claire Kendry and Irene Redfield. Claire has decided to pass for white and is married to a racist white man who hates black people a choice. Uh, while Irene could pass, she chooses not to and is married to a visibly black doctor. It is it is brought up in the book that Irene has kind of internalized the whole separate but equal concept that was passed in the Plessy Supreme Court case and is very much concerned with just maintaining that black upper middle class lifestyle and avoids discussions of race um, especially concerning her black sons, which leads to a lot of conflict between her and her um, husband. They even have like a maid who is darker than her. So there are still within the novel, these tricklings of how colorism plays into the black upper elite. The two are reunited uh, in the novel on a hot day where Irene goes to the Drayton Hotel in Chicago um, and ends up meeting Claire because she is passing. It's so hot that she like is just passing to be white just so she can like get out of the heat. And it's supposedly like the first time she's ever really done that. And Claire sees her and instantly they start catching up. Pardon me, I don't mean to stare, but I think I know you. I'm afraid you're mistaken. No, of course I know you, Rini. You look just the same. Tell me, do they still call you Rini? Yes. Oh, no one's called me that for a long time. Don't you know me? Not really, Rini. I'm afraid I can't seem to place. <laughs> Claire? Mm -hmm. That's right. Not Claire Kendry. We find out that Claire was raised by her two paternal white aunts after her her parents died and lives as a white European woman. Despite all of that, she has this very deep feeling of loneliness having been separated from colored people, from Negroes and as she meets Irene, she starts sending her these letters, and we jump to that in the novel, of her, of, of being reunited with Irene for that one moment really triggers this desire in her to be around her people again. Now she remembers so vividly what she gave up, and it's hard for her to go back into this world of pretending to be a white woman. And as Claire begins to share her plans to resume her identity as a black American woman, Irene sort of develops this sort of paranoia and thinks that, you know, 
Claire's trying to take her man. She is not because, you know, it's a very queer novel in that sense. And meanwhile, there's that growing disharmony within the household of, you know, Irene's husband wants to move the family to Brazil, but apparently he didn't know that Brazil is also very racist, so that would not have been a good idea. And over time, these two women get closer and there is this sort of underlying tension between them. Everything comes to a head where Irene is walking down the street and ends up running into Jack Bello, who is Claire's husband in the street. And when he sees Irene with a non-passing black woman, all of a sudden it clicks in his mind that his wife is is not white. What, what, what the devil is the matter? You don't get to tell me what to do. You have to call I don't any of you to people. Do. At best, you leave. You liar! Careful. Because he recognizes that blackness in Irene and therefore his wife. One thing that's really key is that Claire's husband jokes and calls her nig. Um, you can guess what that is short for. And there is this underlined thing that she doesn't like to have black servants or anything around. And it's because of that fear of being, to use a modern term, clocked, of being seen like, oh, wait, those connections start start to happen. And she's trying very desperately to avoid that. Nick? John, dear. Mm. I ran into an old, old friend of mine from school, Irene Westover. Irene, this is my husband, John Bellew. Do you hear what John called me, Rena? Oh, Claire, please. No, go on. Uh, Tell her why. Oh, it's silly. But when we were first married, this woman was as white as a lily. But as the years go by, she seems to be getting darker and darker. So I told her, if you don't look out, you'll wake up one morning and find that you turned into a nigger. <laughs> yeah, she's been nig ever since. <laughs> Eventually, they go to a party and Claire is confronted by her husband at this party and she falls to her death in a moment that is unclear of she jumped or if Irene or Jack pushed her, no one quite knows. And the police very uh, infamously label the, the death, death by misadventure. So this woman who was trying so deeply to escape blackness and then reconnect with it ends up dying because there is no in-between in this world, which I think is sort of an interesting discussion because I think sometimes in our modern day, we, the binary of race is so not at all comparable to how people's experiences are, but the binary is so upheld because of white supremacy that there is no wiggle room. So I think it's just a very interesting exploration of this. I'll be dead. Nobody could tell from looking at her. No. Most surprising. So let's talk about the film. So Tessa Thompson and Ruth Naga play Irene and Claire respectably, and it's directed by Rebecca Hall, who is herself a white passing mixed race woman. The film is largely pretty accurate to the book, cutting down a few scenes that show like another light skinned friend of Irene and Claire's named Gertrude. Um, in the book, she's kind of a foil to both of them because she could pass for white, but doesn't and is married to a poor white man who is a butcher. And so she kind of has the best of both worlds, I guess, you know, she's married to a white man who respects her, but also gets to keep her blackness, even though she could pass. The book also, as I alluded to, opens differently, um, not necessarily jumping around in time, but starting from when Claire and Irene meet in Chicago and having it have a linear experience without, you know, Claire slow, without Irene slowly being overwhelmed by Claire's longing, very sapphic subtext letters. And I will say, while the sapphic subtext of the novel is maintained, depending on who you ask, it's not really that effective in illustrating that theme. However, I've heard from people who don't even know that the subtext exists in the books. So I feel like it's one of those things where it has been not part of the conversation for such a long time that to me, it seems very readily apparent. 
Sometimes I wonder why we weren't better friends. Oh, we did all right. I always admired you, though. You were always so calm and beautiful in the face of everything. Me? Come on now. You were always the beauty. Not how I see it. All of the performances are solid, although they're solid performances, but I think Tessa was much weaker than Ruth. And I still think that there are some casting issues, especially with Tessa Thompson specifically. But I think Rebecca Hall did an excellent job of directing and, and working with this film. And I think especially for a directorial debut, it is... A triumph. It's really excellent. She did an amazing job with it. I think that she really found a way to to bring this tension to life. And I think that the biggest issues with the film are really that we don't really get a lot of films examining this kind of passing dichotomy in the modern day anymore that aren't like, you know, older magical tragic negro stories. So I think there is sort of like the discourse ended up being bigger than the actual film. Also, Netflix is very bad about letting you know what films they have on there. And I think for me, when it comes down to like the issue of passing and the casting, as I was watching this film, all I could think was, damn, this would be Meghan Markle's movie if she wasn't forcibly retired from acting because she joined the British royal family. And I think that brings us back to the concept of passing and how much that has changed as a concept since the publication of this novel. Lots of people pass all the time. It's easy for a Negro to pass for white. I'm not sure it'd be so simple for a white person to pass for colored. As I said before, there has been a lot of discussion of if Thompson and Nega actually pass in the film, what it means for both white people and black people to pass and how that's culturally shifted, especially since we are living in the era of the blackfish. So historically passing and the tragic mulatto stereotype have been a way of how lighter skinned black characters are depicted. You know, the female character was a light skinned mixed race black woman who would suffer a tragic ending due to her instability along the color line. So she had to suffer some sort of emotional drama. In 1892, the abolitionist Frances E.W. Harper published Iola Leroy, the story of a fair skinned daughter of an enslaved woman and a slave owner who was raised to believe she was white. Iola later learns of her black identity after her father's death. The novel ends with Iola rejecting marriage to a white man, fully accepting her blackness and vowing to devote her life to racial uplift. But in later passing novels by white women, like Ida Ferber's Showboat in 1926, Fanny Hearst's Imitation of Life, 1933, and Sid Ricketts Sumner's Quality in 1946, passing is employed as a melodramatic device and treated as the perilous but necessary manner of confused, tragic mulatto women, forever caught between two worlds that would never understand them. Are you happy here, honey? Are you finding what you really want? I'm somebody else. I'm white. White. White! Then please, Mama, will you go? And never do this again. And if by accident we should ever pass on the street, please don't recognize me. I won't, Sarah Jane. I promise. I settle all that in my mind. There's just one thing I wish from you. What? If you're ever in trouble, if you ever need anything at all, if you ever want to come home and you shouldn't be able to get in touch with me, will you let Miss Laura know? Yes. Yes, anything. Now, will you go? That wasn't all I wanted, honey. That was only part of it. What's the rest? I'd like to hold you in my arms once more. Like you were still my baby. All right, Mama. All right. Oh, Sarah Jane. Much like Harper's novel, Larson's work is different because it isn't about the tragic mulatto per se, but of the complex racial dynamics that come with being a lighter black skinned woman aware of her blackness, but also able to benefit from their proximity to whiteness and wanting to use that not just to like live it up, but to just have basic civil rights. 
Um, a text I have revisited again and again is A Chosen Exile, A History of Racial Passing in American Life by Professor Allison Hobbs about the phenomenon of racial passing in the United States and in the late 18th century to the present. It's a very great book. I used it during my master's thesis about colorism. It's a really interesting read and I will be quoting from it very much during this video. One of the things that's important to understand about passing is how race and ethnicity was defined in specifically North American concepts. In North America, there was a deliberate attempt to keep people out of whiteness. Other countries in South America and the Caribbean have their own racial categories and their own racial history of how that whole works. But for the sake of Nella Larson's text, we will focus on the United States because that is the context in which she grew up and therefore understands it. In America, what amount of blackness qualified you as white or black was very arbitrary. You could be black in one state and white in another, depending on how they broke down the the blood quantities. It's it's very ridiculous. So it was very common to see people that we would today consider white in positions of black leadership identifying as black because at the time they were seen as being black because they were at least I think in most places, it was like, if you were an eighth, then you qualified. It was, it's, it's very arbitrary. As Hobbes writes, passing reveals the bankruptcy of the race idea. It offers a searing critique of racism and disarms racialized thinking. Walter White, the racially ambiguous executive secretary of the National Association for the Advancements of Colored People, the NAACP, who happened to be the great grandson of President William Henry Harrison, made the practice of putting his blonde hair and blue eyes to enter the South during the 1920s to investigate lynching. Biracial and mixed race people were a tool used by many historically, including abolitionists who used them as examples of showing the racial violence that went out in the South. These these abolitionists would look at these light-skinned, passable slaves and Northerners would see like, this is the result of slavery, this sexual violence, this rape that has created these, these, these people who look white, but are still to be presented to us because of slavery as being inferior and how it contradicts the white supremacy that is being promoted, but at the same time being arbitrarily uplifted in order to maintain these racial hierarchies. And because mixed race people and biracial people undermined these conflicts, they were viewed with suspicion and discomfort, especially among white supremacists, because it's like, if you're trying to tell people that Negro blood makes you inferior, but you have all these white passing intellectual attractive people in attractive in the sense of white supremacy, that spits in the face of a society that considers that blood to be inferior. Not to mention before slavery was abolished, passing, was also used to allow enslaved people to escape by pretending to be white, showing that again, these qualifications are just arbitrary because if you could perform whiteness, then you could pass. Now in the era where Larson was writing, to pass was no longer simply about escaping slavery, but now with escaping Jim Crow segregation and the secondhand citizenship of black identity. So, in that sense, to pass, you had to become white, cut ties with your black family, friends, and community, and become that that mask of whiteness. And the thing about it, it was like the severance of the soul is what people would describe it as. It was about giving up something very key, your sense of community, in order to get the rest that you were technically entitled to, but that didn't matter in society. The practice allowed those who could pass a means of clandestinely navigating the Jim Crow order. Passing offered much, but it could not mend splintered relationships with one's family. It could not ease a deep-rooted sense of alienation and longing for one's people. Passing was unfit for the task of merging two selves into a better and truer self. This curious phenomenon granted economic privileges and social courtesies, even transformational opportunities for self-fashioning, but often at a terrible cost. For Claire, that cost is paid with her own life. And it says a lot about her that she even chose to marry a man who was so racist, literally picking someone who would encourage her to stay away from black people because that temptation was too strong that she had to have literally the threat 
of a racist to help her maintain it. But when she sees Irene, it's no longer worth it. Being white is no longer worth it. What is it, Rainey? Have you ever thought of what you'd do if John found out? Yes. Don't fall by the wayside before the fourth floor. I absolutely refuse to carry anybody up more than two flights. <laughs> And what would you? I do what I want more than anything right now. I come up here to live. We live in the era of black fishing becoming a term where non-black folks appropriate our language, bronze themselves up, and in some famous cases lie about their blackness entirely, taking advantage of the fact that black people, especially those of us descended from slavery, come in many different hues and phenotypes. And you know, manipulate that for their own devices, taking advantage of colorism, taking advantage of the, 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 the after effects of generations of sexual abuse into this. Because of this, Black people have become hypervigilant about protecting who is called Black, for better or for worse. I think that it is largely an important thing. However, it can sometimes lead to some very ahistorical discussions, but that is... That's a whole nother conversation. Blackness, colorism, light skin privilege are all real things, but they are also socially constructed and change over time. A generation ago, there really was no biracial identity. You were either black or not, non-white or white. Now we have entire TikTokers whose entire identity is saying the N-word and then pulling out their black grandmas. But even that is historically complicated because historically, Having a black grandma was enough to give you blackness legally. <laughs> that, that was enough. And um, now you have black biracial kids growing up raised by white moms and that's very normalized in media and celebrity and everything. So there is a very big disconnect about the pre miscegenation laws that made it illegal, made it marginalized, made it so that it was very difficult to grow up biracial. And why it's not, while it's not, completely easy peasy lemon squeezy now it is definitely not uncommon i mean like our first president was biracial Meghan markle you know zendaya we we have all the memes about it she's biracial being a black biracial person has become its own sort of category of blackness because that is what has raised to the surface in many ways in terms of mainstream Hollywood black identity, which is different because when we look at light skinned black actors from the past, they weren't biracial in the same way that we would consider them today, but they were lighter skinned. They would just come from these very talented 10th uh, families where it's like, oh, we're, we only marry fellow light skins. We're not risking it, but they're not biracial in the sense of like Halle Berry, who I think while it, she is biracial, I don't think anyone looks at Halle Berry and thinks, white woman <laughs> like it, and that's the thing is like being biracial being mixed race is a grab bag i mean um naya rivera rest in peace you know she was afro latina and she very much has a more what people would consider the most sort of like tv latina look however her brother who she says the exact same two parents and looks very black very phenotypically black so you like none of those things are really indicators of stuff. I always have this discussion when I talk about Halsey because everyone always jokes about Halsey, like how how black is she really? And I think that she has been very good about as she gets older, being better at identifying the, the nuances of being a light-skinned multiracial person who identifies with her black side of her family. But I think it's very much like people want the receipts. Uh, same with my girl Kehlani, but I will say as long as the pops continue, as long as I can get, so, as long as we got a grandma pick, I'm like, okay, it's fine. <laughs> but that brings us to like, how do you cast a movie like Passing in 2022? And one of the things that the movie and book discuss, and it was discussed on Twitter, is that Passing is about fooling white people, not black people, but we as black folks should be able to clock it. While that is true, I still think Tessa Thompson was miscast. She does not pass at all. It should have been played by like, again, a Meghan Markle. Meghan Markle would have ate this role. Um, I think Ruth should have been Irene. 
And someone like Rebecca Hall herself should have played Claire or even um, Torian Bellisandro from Pretty Little Liars, uh, the actress who played Spencer, because she is a very white passing biracial woman. There, to me, there's no way to look at Tessa Thompson and, and not see a black woman in any way. And she's not that light skinned either. She's just like, mixed you know like it's, it's it's to me it's one of those things where it's like there's a difference between between being light-skinned being mixed race like those are not the same thing they're not interchangeable statements and so like there is something about tessa tessa thompson just doesn't look like she's not black so i just don't see it <laughs> the nose is the nose doesn't lie at least we have white people on the record saying that they don't see Meghan Markle as black which again I and I think about it too which is so hilarious is that when you look at her terrible white family she definitely has a lot of their features but just like like her mother locked it down but she took some of them features like oh you have this you can have this but then Meghan was just like mm, but freckles and bronze and I'm just like that's my girl I've never heard that with Ruth Nega um but I do think that she fits that sort of like aesthetic in a much better way. If I think if it had been someone else besides Tessa Thompson, it would have been better. I, I think that them together make the passing almost non-existent. I think if you had like Ruth Nega as Irene and like, again, just for the sake of conversation, Spencer from Pretty Little Liars, then I think you have a much more interesting conversation because while yes, it's meant to fool white people. You are also trying to create enough of a barrier between yourself and blackness. And I don't think that Tessa Thompson does that. In conclusion, Passing is a really interesting text and the film does capture some of the nuances. We rarely get this kind of film made that's about black people based on a classic black text and is made by someone who has real attachment and experience to the realities of that novel. I think that I wish we got more of that. I wish more Harlem Renaissance and Black literary classics were adapted besides just slave narratives, not because those aren't worth doing, but it says a lot about the type, like, you know, the, the, the fe more female-centric ones and more dealing with the intricacies of being a woman femme and being in these environments of what it is like to live in that skin. I think there's plenty of stories like that that have been really untouched and I'm glad that this was made. I just wish that I wish that it had been treated with a little bit more. Yeah, actually, I wish I'm, I'm disappointed it didn't catch on more, but I think it's such a quieter, less tragic kind of movie. And those tend to be hard to market. But I thought it was really well done. I thought Ruth Nega was fantastic. This should have definitely been her second nomination. Um, and I hope that... Rebecca Hall makes something really excellent in Black in the future because clearly she felt that calling too and I'm glad she did and I'm glad that she used her directorial debut to talk about a really excellent Black woman novel. So yeah, if you haven't seen Passing, check it out. I think it's worth discussing and I think it's really interesting and I hope that we get more Black classics adapted by people who get get the material, understand the assignments.